Hello, and welcome to the third episode of Among the Ancients with Emily Wilson, a podcast series from the London Review of Books. I'm Thomas Jones, an editor at the LRB. Emily Wilson is Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Hello, Emily, and thank you very much for joining me again. I'm excited to talk about Sappho. Yes, in previous episodes, we, we talked about the Iliad and the Odyssey, and this time we're moving from epic to lyric, though we will be questioning those categories, as we consider the poems of Sappho and what remains of them, along with the ways that they've been received and reimagined over the centuries. So unlike Homer, about whom we know nothing, even whether or not he existed at all, we know a bit about who Sappho herself was, where and roughly when she was born, who her family were. So do you want to talk us briefly through Sappho's biography, or as much as we know of it? Sure, as much as we know. So we know that she lived most of her life on the island of Lesbos, which was in the Greek-speaking world and was the location of multiple different um, Greek city-states. Lesbos is in the eastern part of the Greek-speaking world, so it was very close to Asia Minor. There were lots of references in her poetry to Lydia and to the east. We also know that she was part of an aristocratic and presumably wealthy family. She refers to her three brothers. She doesn't name her father, though um, ancient sources tell us about 12 different names for her father, so presumably nobody really know, knew uh, who he was. She refers to her daughter, so presumably she was married and had a daughter. We also know pretty much for sure that she was exiled to Sicily and then presumably came back to Lesbos at some point. So she lived during a time of great political turbulence on the island of Lesbos, um, with factions of populist tyrants wanting to seize power versus the old aristocratic families. And Sappho's family was presumably part of the aristocratic, oligarchic guard. And presumably the, the exile was a political exile with a, an attempt by the populist factions to get rid of the aristocratic families. So I think we sort of tend to think of Sappho as totally unpolitical because, of course, she was a woman and her poetry is often read as celebrating domestic, quiet life. But I think there are ways you can read Sappho as... Um, in some ways political, in that she's focused on the joys of a very specifically luxury-oriented, consumer goods-oriented um, aristocratic leisure lifestyle, where you have time to fuss about your headband and the wonderful fruit you can eat and the girls you can have crushes on. Um, but for a long time, the, the thing that was most known or thought to be known about, about her life was a, was a completely spurious story that we, we know from a poem probably by Ovid or attributed to Ovid, from the Herodes, about Sappho falling in love not with a woman but with a ferryman called, called Phaon and throwing herself from a clifftop in despair. And there's an 18th century translation by Pope that, among other things, uses repeatedly the term lesbian dames, which these days sounds a bit like <laughs> Raymond Chan, the fanfic. But the, um, and one reason that Ovid's version of Sappho was so dominant for so long is that so little of Sappho's own verse survived antiquity? I mean, and, and was it, was that taken as biographical truth about Sappho um, for hundreds of years or not really? Well, so Ovid's Heroides is a, is a sequence of verse epistles, which is spoken by women to their beloveds, usually absent cheating beloveds. So the first one is Penelope talking to Odysseus and saying, why haven't you come home yet? It's been an awfully long time. And then we also have Briseis talking to Achilles and saying, it's, it's kind, of, kind of hard for me, this whole Trojan War thing. Um, so most of the Herodes are not supposed to be historical. And I, I think sort of putting the Sappho epistle to to Phaon in, in that category also hints that this is a biographical myth rather than a biographical, please fact check this kind of narrative. Um, it's clearly not designed to be fact checked and it wouldn't survive, survive the fact checking. But I also think that it's very likely that the, um, the legends about Sappho's life and her both falling in love in this doomed heteronormative way and then killing herself as a result, I think those legends probably go back far, far before Ovid. We also have some poems which use Sappho's name, and it's quite possible that her contemporary lyric poet, Alcaeus, who also lived on Lesbo Lesbos, um, I think it's possible that, um, and some scholars believe that he, he, even during Sappho's lifetime, was composing poems where it was sort of a dialogue riff between Alcaeus and Sappho. We're going to have a dialogue and argue, and it's going to be men's poetry versus women's poetry, or 
different genres of lyric poetry are going to duke it out. And Sappho, in, in that instance, not really being used as a, this is the biographical Sappho appearing, because of course, actually, men and women weren't performing in the same poetic performance space. It's about sort of using her name as a stand-in for what would a, what would a creative woman artist sound like, and let's make it all up. You wrote in the NRB in 2003 that reconstructing Sappho from what remains is like trying to get a sense of a whole Tyrannosaurus rex from one claw. Yes. Um, and, and so what happened to Sappho's poems? How were they collected? How were they lost? And how did they survive or the remnants that did survive? Well, we know that Sappho was a pretty prolific poet. I mean, she didn't just write little teeny tiny fragments. She wrote, we're told, nine books of lyric poetry in multiple different genres. And nine books is actually quite a lot. It's, it's, not, it's not that she, that it was sort of slim chapbooks. Um, and what we used to have of Sappho before the late 19th century was a couple of poems that are preserved through quotation. So one of the longest quotations comes from the, um, the text called On the Sublime by Pseudo Longinus. And he quotes as an example of sublimity, the famous poem where, where Sappho is listing all her um, symptoms as she gazes at at a woman talking to a man and she's looking at this totally desirable woman and her, her the speaker's body is sort of decomposing with desire for this woman. Um, and Longinus or pseudo Longinus comments on what an amazing and sublime mode of description this is. Most of the other little bits of Sappho that we used to have were from quotations from writers who weren't necessarily interested in poetics. So we have a lot of quotations of little bits of Sappho from grammatical writers who are interested in pronouns and quote a couple of bits of Sappho because she writes in this interesting dialect of Greek and look at, look at how the pronouns are in Sappho and quote two lines or two words. So that was how it was. That was, that was the state of play until the late 19th century was just quotations, basically. And then in the late 19th century, um, archaeologists started digging at Oxyrhynchus in Egypt, where there was this sort of trash heap, rubbish dump, um, which turned out to include all these um, paper remains from what's called cartonnage, which is like a sort of ancient papier-mâché, where they use scraps of papyrus, which might actually have writing on it, and turned out in many cases to have writing on it, for things like book bindings or producing mummies to wrap up dead bodies in. And it turned out that it was possible through the techniques of archaeology to and papyrology to reconstruct some of these scraps of papyrus. And some of them turned out to have actual texts on them, including text by Sappho. So in the late 19th century, several bits of Sappho that hadn't been known up till that point were rediscovered, such as the wonderful poem 16, which tells about all the different things that um, you might write about in epic, but what really matters is the one you, one you love, the one you want or, or desire. And then in the 21st century, when it seemed as if we'd already got all the Sappho we could possibly have, even more Sappho was discovered from that same trash heap, because there was, there's still more papyrus that hasn't been assembled and interpreted yet. So it's kind of amazing that Sappho keeps on producing new poetry even into the 21st century, even into 2014. And it wasn't just Sappho, was it? There were new plays by Euripides were found in, the, in it as well. Yes, lots of quotations and lots of scraps, yes. And does the fact that these scraps of paper that were in a rubbish heap had the writings of Sappho on them, does that imply that there was a huge amount of papyrus which had Sappho's writings on. So any rubbish, you have a rubbish dump. Some of the newspaper that the fish and chips are wrapped in, as it were, is going to have <laughs> Sappho on it. It implies, it implies popularity several centuries after, after her, her life. Absolutely, yes. And, and also popularity far beyond her, her own geographical sphere. I mean, Egypt is quite a long way from Lesbos, but clearly her poetry was circulating all over the Greek-speaking world. And, uh, and the nine books of at least a thousand lines each. There's the first book we know had 1,300 lines in it. So the, the entire, so all nine books would have been maybe this, as long as the Odyssey. Maybe, or maybe half the Odyssey. I mean, given that the Homeric poems are, you know, books clearly is a variable length with integrity. Yes, <laughs> yes. And they were lost when the Library of Alexandria was burned with everything else. That's right, um, yes. There. Um, and the only... One of her poems, this right, survives in its entirety because it was quoted in full by Dionysius of 
Harlequinassus. That's right, yes. Which comes first in sort of collections. It's poem one or fragment one, even though it's not, I suppose, not technically a fragment because it's an entire poem. And should we listen to a reading of that now in Anne Carson's translation? Deathless Aphrodite of the spangled mind, child of Zeus who twists laws, I beg you, do not break with hard pains, O oh lady, my heart. But come here, if ever before you caught my voice far off, and listening left your father's golden house and came, yoking your car, and fine birds brought you quick sparrows over the black earth, whipping their wings down the sky through midair. They arrived. But you, O oh blessed one, smiled in your deathless face and asked what, now again, I have suffered and why, now again, I am calling out. And what I want to happen most of all in my crazy heart, whom should I persuade now again to lead you back into her love? Who, O oh Sappho, is wronging you? For if she flees, soon she will pursue. If she refuses gifts, rather will she give them. If she does not love, soon she will love, even unwilling. Come to me now. Loose me from hard care and all my heart longs to accomplish, accomplish you. Be my ally. Thanks for listening to this extract from Among the Ancients, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.